When Seppi tanks are closing in on your position, you're gonna call for armor support. But when they aren't available, you're gonna rely on the dependable AV-7. What's up, Nerds? Today we're doing a deep dive into the Republic AV-7 anti-vehicle cannon, using both legends and cannon sources to construct a full picture of this vehicle, its stats, capabilities, and role in the Grand Army of the Republic. The AV-7 serves the dual role of anti-vehicle cannon and medium artillery piece for the Grand Army of the Republic. We will discuss both of these roles, and how the AV-7 serves them on the battlefronts of the Clone Wars as well as the technical specifications, real-world comparisons, and behind-the-scenes facts. Thanks Pinecone for sponsoring this video. This is nothing like any survey company out there. Pinecone is invite only, so by using my link to get in, you can share your opinions on all kinds of products that you already love. There are even chances to get hands-on and test and review products, all with guaranteed payouts for everything you do. I've done one on, let's say, Jawa Juice. I even googled it and it's really cool to see that it's not even out yet. It's a pre-made drink version of something that is just annoying enough that I'm probably never going to make it at home, and so they're selling it pre-made. So I'm genuinely excited to see this behind the scenes peak, provide my input on the ad campaign before it even goes out the stores. Like feedback on the ad style, the wording of the product, all kinds of stuff like that. And I get paid to do it. Use it during weird lost time in your day instead of doom scrolling, and it really is a good side hustle. Hey stop, I'm making money and changing the world! Once you answer questions about your demographics, all kinds of surveys will pop up, and you can do them at whatever pace you want. So click on my exclusive link to start earning cash with Pinecone. First and most importantly, what's in the name? The AV-7's primary task is destruction of enemy vehicles. The cannon itself is served by one gunner seated in an open mount, with a selection of screens in front of him displaying targeting data likely fed from the forward spotters or orbital reconnaissance. Depending on range to target, the cannon will elevate or depress, aided by the four-leg assembly the cannon is mounted on, which can flex to allow additional range of motion for targeting. The legs also serve as shock absorbers, reducing the cannon's recoil as it fires. It is firing plasma energy shells, capable of destroying AATs and snail tanks with a single direct hit. The AV-7's shells fall on the target in a shallow arc rather than drilling into them from the front, resulting in hits impacting the weaker topside and or the rear armor of enemy armored assets, resulting in almost guaranteed kills. They can crank down for direct fire as well, creating enough blast and overpressure to wipe out friendly and enemy infantry alike with impunity, as Captain Rex noted during the Battle of Christophsis. The AV-7s also fulfill the role of medium artillery, providing indirect fire support to GAR forces at moderate range. On the battlefield, SPHATs and AV-7s would likely work together, with SPHATs firing at extreme long range at major enemy targets, while AV-7s could focus on tactical fire support against enemy infantry and armor. Their plasma shells were more than capable of shattering closely packed Separatist droid columns, and the overpressure from the blast could kill or injure organics as well even when not in the direct blast radius. While the ammunition fired by the AV-7s was plasma and not kinetic, they could nevertheless be programmed to detonate at selective heights, such as at head level to inflict maximum casualties against infantry. Rex calculated a final firing solution that would cause maximum destruction of the armored column and droids if they placed a few rounds just so. Set them to cook off at chest height rather than on impact. The explosion would flatten anything standing, and the shrapnel from the droids would kill any organics standing in the blast radius. AV-7s were seen throughout the Clone Wars, from the Battle of Christophsis to the Second Battle of Geonosis. And while the plasma shells were devastating against unshielded targets, they had difficulty penetrating enemy shields, both vehicle-based and larger theater deflector shields. The deployment of a theater ray shield by Confederate General Warm Loathsome completely nullified the firepower of a quartet of these guns. While during the siege of Poggle the Lesser's factory, the AV-7s were unable to penetrate the shielding of the newly deployed Separatist super tanks. Here we see a major weakness in the AV-7s as well. Despite their tremendous firepower, they are incredibly vulnerable to all manner of enemy return fire. Rockets, tank shells, and even infantry blasters pose a threat to this cannon, as it is an unarmored vehicle with an exposed gunner. In the anti-tank role, the AV-7 is depending on its range, hoping to neutralize the target before it can return enemy fire. In this way, the AV-7 is depending on range, concealment, and firepower for survival, similar to the World War II era anti-tank guns such as the Pac-40. In the counter-battery role, the AV-7's open design makes it more vulnerable to CIS armored artillery, such as the HAGM. Thus, it is best employed in entrenched positions to lessen the effect of incoming enemy fire, using the firing arc so that it can stay behind cover and only have to worry about enemy air or artillery. But the final advantage possessed by the AV-7 is its mobility. Despite its appearance, it does not rely on its legs as its primary means of locomotion. 
like say its counterpart, the J1 Proton Cannon. Instead, its legs fold under the chassis and the AV-7 moves via a built-in repulsor lift. This puts the AV-7 in a class of self-propelled artillery, able to move with Republic armored columns and deploy as needed rather than relying on space or aerial transport for redeployment. The repulsor lift would enable the AV-7 to employ shoot-and-scoot tactics in counter-battery operations, firing salvos at enemy artillery positions, then quickly redeploying before enemy rangefinders can triangulate their position and return fire. The AV-7 was also mounted on rail assemblies as part of some Venator-class Star Destroyers, being the secondary armament along its port and starboard trenches, between the brim and hull decks. These cannons lack legs and instead are built into rolling rails to aid in absorption of recoil. This was likely an improvised measure as these weapons were not a part of the Venator's standard armament, and may have been a late war practice on an informal basis, such as the addition of SPHATs to bolster a Venator's ventral armament in the Open Circle Fleet. Now for some stats and comparisons of the AV-7. It was manufactured by the firm Tame & Back, responsible for all manner of turbo laser weaponry, costing the Republic 14,000 credits apiece brand new. However, by the time these weapons left the GAR service, they could be picked up secondhand for as little as 8,000 credits. So that's a lot of firepower for planetary security forces, rebels, and whoever else could get their hands on these guns, as they were phased out of the Empire in favor of more modern and effective artillery designs, such as the M102 Fire Arc, SPMA, and the V1A8 Penetrator. Though the main cost of this thing is going to be in the shells, but since they are plasma, perhaps it is running off of common Tabana gas. It might be one of the cheapest bang for your bucks out there in the galaxy. Including the cannon, the AV-7 was a hair over 15 meters in length, which means if it was brought to Earth, it would stand the same length as a standard US semi-trailer. While no stats exist for its width, approximating by the size of the cannon barrel and gunner, the AV-7 is about 9 meters in width, or 4 golf carts end to end. Sadly, we get no weight approximation for the AV-7, making it difficult to determine how powerful its built-in repulsor is. And now for some cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. In the last video on the ATRT Frogwalker, I forgot to mention that the main advantage of walkers is that they can walk through shields. All repulsor lift technology, which makes everything hover in the Star Wars universe, repels against all forms of energy shields, like the same poles of a magnet. But if this cannon could not walk on those feet, instead using the repulsor tech, then it wouldn't have been able to go in and out of shielding. Which isn't that much of a deal breaker for artillery, it's not supposed to be scrambling all across the battlefront, but it may have limited the scoot and shoot tactics, meaning you couldn't have your shields up, move out of it to fire, and then move back in. Like you could if you were using the ATTE in a kind of artillery roll. The AV-7 has popped up in several modes and games throughout the years. The 2011 Hasbro model comes with a tread-based propulsion system, a decidedly non-canon, if interesting, variant. Just look at the silly little treads on the feet. But if you want to use the AV-7s in action yourself, you can try out a number of Empire at War mods, such as the Fall of the Republic or Republic at War. As mentioned before, the AV-7's design and operations mimic that of World War II-era anti-tank guns, such as the Pac-40, Soviet 45, and 57mm, and US M1 anti-tank gun. Like the AV-7, these guns were much simpler to produce than entire tanks, but provide similar firepower at the expense of crew protection and maneuverability. So that's it for the breakdown. If you made it this far, please hit that like button, comment your thoughts on this or suggestions, subscribe to see more, but most important of all, remember, beware the overpressure, and the force will be with you. Always.